Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good day. So I'd like to appreciate all of you attending here. This is the first, um, I'm sorry, this is the 11th IFSO webinar in conjunction with third APC webinar. So that uh, this is the first time the ISO APC uh, worked together with the ISO webinar. So I would like to introduce my colleagues here to present the slide. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, I'm uh, Kazu Kasama from Japan. I'm now playing a role of uh, ISO APC president. And uh, our brilliant speakers, uh, the debaters, is uh, Dr. Lakudawala from India and uh, Dr. Yosuke Seki from Japan. Please have some comments from both of you. First, Murphy, please. It's great to be here. Uh, and I think uh, it's a great topic, especially relevant for Asia. But it's great that a lot of people from all across the world have uh, hooked into it, and uh, I think we're going to have some fun because Seki is a very, very brilliant academician. Thank you, Murphy. So, Yosuke, please. Um, I'm Yosuke Seki from Japan, and uh, it's uh, a great honor to have a chance to uh, talk uh, about this very interesting topic, and I hope that everybody can enjoy. Thank you. Okay, so that our panelists, we have a three the leading surgeon from Asian Pacific region, the one from the Korea, Professor Che. Please have some comment. Okay, thank you, uh, Kazu. And uh, I think it is a great opportunity to discuss the uh, metabolic surgery for Asian people. I hope uh, we will have a great uh, uh, lecture and uh, we can get a uh, great answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And then, uh, Professor Shikia Huang from Taiwan, please. Hello, hi everybody. Uh, nice, to, uh, nice to meet you again. Uh, welcome all the friends from the whole world. Uh, we look forward to this uh, new concept of Sleep Plus. I think that that would be very great fun and uh, would be a very great debate. We can get a lot of results from this presentation. Let's see. Thanks. And then, at last, not least, the Professor Ken Loy from Australia. Hello, everyone. Welcome. And I think I, I'm here to learn as well, but I hopefully can share some experience because in Australia, I think this type of surgery is not that common. And, and I think it's actually good to see what everyone doing in the world. I look forward for the webinar. Thank you, Ken. And uh, this webinar is recorded and will be uploaded in ISO and the APC website. Also, the question from audience will be accepted at the time of question and discussion in the latter half of the, the, this webinar. And also, we can use a polling system. It will be activated a few times during the webinar. So your reaction is highly appreciated. And uh, before the battle, I would like to talk about uh, uh, some kinds of overview. And then the, the first point, no, no, not yet. Let me show the agenda. So then the pouring of the audience and also, and after that, we have a lecture, two lectures from the Professor Lakudawara and the Professor Seki. And the, also after that, we have a rebuttal. And also that we can accept the question, the com comments from audience, and then we have a discussion time. So I'd like to talk about the overview of the sleep plus. So some of uh, my our colleagues here doesn't know much about the sleep plus, but this time sleep plus was invented by Shike Wang here, and he started to use this term. This is very useful and uh, easy to understand the sleep plus some kind of procedures. And the first procedure was done by our group and the sleep plus DJB. It was first to avoid gastric cancer or bypass stomach after rheumatic gastric bypass. 
And that was just a modification of BPDDS to avoid malnutrition or aging. Next, please. Next, please. Yeah, so the three plus is a sleep gastrectomy plus some kind of bypass on the horse of some kind of anti reflex procedures. Next, please. The three plus contains this kind of uh, some amount of uh, some kind of bypass procedures and also the, the, the anti reflex procedures. So I'd like to go to the first poll. So have you ever known the term sleep plus? The Please click yes or no. I know some of the, the Asian the surgeon know about pre sleepers, but uh, the other region don't know much about sleepers term. So that uh, let me check the term. How much of the people know the term of three plus? So we have a few minutes, a few seconds to go. Yeah. So I'd like to talk about the result. 58% of the, the people here know the term of three plus. That's great, CK. It's you invented okay. this term. Yeah. Okay. And uh, nice. Yeah, that's nice. And also, I'd like to know. Yeah, yeah. This is a result. That's good. It's uh more than we thought. More than I think. I thought. So let me go to the second one. The second question. That do you think blue MI gastric bypass is better than three plus for your Asian patients? So blue MI gastric bypass is a classic and uh, one of the most popular bariatric procedures. And then the three plus is a new concept. So I'm waiting for the, the uh, boring. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really nice. Yes, <laughs> wow, it's almost 60% said yes. Thank you guys. <laughs> so the, the, no, so I'd like to go to the the debate. The first speaker is uh, Dr. Lakdawar. So please start your presentation, Mufi. So I, uh, hello everybody. And as you can see that, uh, is that one second? Yes. Can you see my screen please? Ah, yes, we can see. Uh, yes. All right. So as as you could see, uh, so the Rua My Gastric Bypass is where I'm supposed to speak today. We all know how the Rua My Gastric Bypass is done. And there are different variations. The banded variation is one of them. And nowadays, the new added variation of increasing the biliopancreatic limb becomes. So this is not something new. This is a very, very old procedure. And it was one of the only procedures, the first procedures, which we thought was supposed to be the uh, game changer in terms of treatment for type 2 diabetes, at least in the adult population. We also do know that there are lots of uh, level 1A evidence to prove that a gastric bypass surgery is better than intensive lifestyle as well as medical in this paper, a crossroads trial from David Cummings. As you can see, the HbA1c fasting glucose levels and various other parameters for type 2 diabetes as by the American Diabetes Association all gastric bypass, which idly is supposed to be technically the gold standard procedure, has got better results. 
Then this paper, which includes some of the Asian data from AJ Lee's group, from Saeed Ekramuddin, again, in terms of management of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia, again, a Ruamai gastric bypass is way ahead of uh, the, the competition in terms of intensive lifestyle, and even at uh, five year and two year outcomes, as you can see out over here. Now, this is paper from CK, who's a, a part of this panel today. And even his case, the Ruamai gastric bypass, even in a lower BMI, between 25 to 35, has shown very, very good results. So my uh, take with this meta-analysis, which also shows that the Ruamai gastric bypass across all these authors, and a lot of them are Asians, shows that the Ruamai gastric bypass is a time-tested proven method to treat not only short-term outcomes with the Ruamai gastric bypass, but even like in this case, five-year results from Brazil, from Ricardo Cohen's group, uh, saying that even at five years in the low BMI group, we've got more than 88% remission. This is from our group from India. Again, in the low BMI, we are seeing that at least 73.1% and more than a 95% total improvement in gastric bypass, even in the low BMI group. And the reason why I talk about low BMI is because that is where Asia stands today in terms of type 2 diabetes. Now, in terms of weight loss, we also do know that even at 10 years follow-up, a Ruamai gastric bypass, give and take a little bit here and there, will always maintain its weight loss, irrespective of uh, whatever we uh, compare to all the other procedures. But today, sleep gastrectomy becomes the number one worldwide procedure, and the Ruamai gastric bypass is falling. So what about the sleeve gastrectomy is so attractive? Well, sleeve gastrectomy, as you know, is a great procedure in a high-risk patient, a super, super obese patient, patients with complex abdominal wall hernias, small bowel resections, Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, transplant recipients and candidates, uh, patients give and take a little bit of psychiatric history, those with active smokers, uh, NSAID users, and the only, only place where uh, probably it's a contraindication today, remains a, a severe GERD or a bad series of fingers. But that's also debatable for those people who believe only in the sleep gastrectomy. What about type 2 diabetes mellitus? Well, hitherto, all the data that we had proved that Aruma gastric bypass was better. But after this score, we do know that probably it's only in the mild and moderate uh, with this Cleveland score that uh, the uh, Ruama gastric bypass is better. With the severe patients with type 2 diabetes, both have equally good results. So when we compare the sleeve with the Ruama gastric bypass, we do know that this paper, the SAMPI trial at one year, at three years, as well as at five years, have all shown that the Ruama gastric bypass works far better than the sleeve gastrectomy alone at least. So we need to do a little bit more with the sleeve, at least in the more complex, more moderate uh, patients with sleeve. Now, what about the sleep plus randomized clinical trial? Well, we do know with this study that probably maybe the sleeve gastrectomy and the Ruma gastric bypass more or less does the same. And this uh, paper, again, the SM BOSS trial, again, if you see the sleeve gastrectomy and the Ruma gastric bypass have got almost similar results. It's only in the sleeve that the, the those with diabetes have worsened rather than getting better, though Ruamai gastric bypass is better. This paper compares the OAGB Ruamai gastric bypass and the sleeve, where again, it has been shown that maybe the Ruamai gastric bypass and the OAGB is slightly better than the sleeve. So Ali Aminin and his group compared all these various level 1A evidence, the Stampede, the sleeve pass, and the SM BOSS trials, and what they noticed is that give and take a little bit of 5% difference, but the sleeve kind of was almost similar. But we also do know that the sleeve gastrectomy has its own Achilles heel. One is weight regain, and the other one is GERD. And that's no debate about that, okay? Long-term, your results show that the mean uh, weight loss, other than Rawlings study, most of the times we accept a 50 to 55% total body, uh, excess body weight loss at five years and beyond. As you can see out over here, that at eight years, with very few numbers, we still do know that the sleep gastrectomy does regain weight. There are lots of lots of ways of uh, calculating how sleep gastrectomy does put on weight. And various studies have mentioned various things. So we don't have one parameter which says how a sleep gastrectomy should be clarified when they re do regain weight. 
Therefore, we need sleeve plus procedures. We need an add-on procedure. Sleeve hysterectomy alone, we do know, over a period of time, might not be the answer for, for the super obese, might not be the answer for diabetic patients, irrespective of all the uh, things that I told you before, where a sleeve is an indicated case. Therefore, we've got the SADI S and, and the duodenal switch. Now, both of them, the sleeve is done as a first stage, and the SARDS is done, because if you do the SARDS or a DS along at the first stage, then we do know that the morbidity and mortality figures are much higher. We've also played around with the ileal transposition, both diverted as well as non-diverted. And then we've got various, various options of the sleeve by partition. You can either do it this way, uh, which is Santoro's way, or you can do it loop like uh, Wilfred Mui and, and his colleagues have done in, in Hong Kong. I leave the results to Seki to speak on these uh, procedures. But we do know that when you do regain weight with the sleeve, and these are some of our own data, we do know that if you add on a plus procedure to the sleeve, you do get additional weight loss. You also get very good remission rates with diabetes, hypertension, sleep apnea, dyslipidemia. So when you add on another procedure along with the sleeve at a second term, you do get very good results, as you can see in this uh, data, unpublished data from our side. Uh, now, what if we compare the duodenal switch or the biliopancreatic diversion, which are ideally supposed to be the best procedure for weight loss as well as for diabetes remission? Well, this paper tells us something otherwise. If you, if you go to see that GRD is the only quality of life questionnaire which increases with the duodenal switch as compared to the other things. And the percentage weight loss actually at, at long term, at almost 18 months, is not that different. It's maybe four or five BMI points, uh, total body weight loss points different. So it's not too different uh, in the long term. And therefore we get the low BMI and that's where we talk about Asia. So we've got, uh, like Kazoo said right now, we've got Kazoo's variation of the Ruawai uh, sleeve DJB, which uh, say he will speak about. We've got uh, Dr. Wang's uh, modification of the loop uh, Ruawai uh, DJB, but we've also got the PJB or the proximal jejunal bypass which is emerging and some endoscopic uh, uh, options of doing it have also emerged. We do know that Professor Alamav from Chile has also spoken about the proximal jejunal bypass and very good results where they don't believe that duodenal exclusion is important, but rather the, uh, just the proximal jejunum needs to be excluded uh, from the food and therefore they don't believe in the Fogger theory of hypothesis. Uh, there are two human studies so far which, uh, uh, which started this whole thing. One was from John Melissa's group, uh, as well as uh, from the, the Chinese group, as you can see here. And both are very, very early studies that show that maybe the PJP has got a role to play. However, there's no long-term data to prove. When we compare the Ruawai gastric bypass with the sleep plus procedure, this is again uh, papers from Korea. Okay, from Dr. Kim's group. And what he believes is that the DJB is not an effective method of controlling type 2 diabetes. Probably it's in the most severe form than what Seki will show later on. And a Ruamai gastric bypass is maybe a better option. Uh, this is what they've said. This is probably in Raj's group, where he's actually said that the, the sleeve DJB does work, but however, there's no long-term follow-up in his uh, paper. This is uh, the number of sleeve DJBs we've done in our group. And I've just put a snapshot of, of what we've done. Unfortunately, if you see, what we do see is only 12 out of the 28 had, uh, had no remission of diabetes. In fact, the diabetes did not go away despite the proximal uh, bypass. Six out of 28 had, had remission. So more number of people didn't have remission. We could probably were doing it in the more complex diabetics in this group because we believe that by passing 200 centimeters of the uh, uh, pan biliopancreatic limb probably would give us better remission. That's why we did the sleeve DJB in this group. But however, 11 out of these 28 patients had persistent reflux. And that is something that we need to know, which will happen with the sleeve, irrespective of the pylorus being intact. So the problems with the sleeve persist. In addition, we are adding a problems of a sleeve plus uh, which is malabsorption. So we should not ignore the elephant in the room when we talk about the sleep plus procedures. We do know that quite like the OAGB, and we all talk about bile reflux, the sleep DJB or the SARDS will also have its own set of bile reflux, which is mixed 
uh, acid and bile reflux. As well as the supplementation, this is the way we supplement all our patients. So we do increase the supplementation, even in the sleeve DJB, just to match up with the amount of uh, supplementation that these patients need. This after supplementation also, you can see that the iron levels remain low in a sleeve press procedure, which does not necessarily happen with the Rouen-Y gastric bypass procedure. And then we have quality of life uh, questions. We, in some patients, we have constipation in the sleeve DJP. In the others, with, uh, we have loose tools. We have bloating and heartburn, which actually never really happens with the Rouen-Y gastric bypass procedure. So to conclude, I would like to say that the duodenal anastomosis is more difficult for any given surgeon. Even skilled surgeons will tell you that a gastric anastomosis is far, far more easy than a duodenal anastomosis. There is always going to be a mixed reflux in reality of a loop anastomosis whenever uh, you take in the long-term sequelae of uh, esophageal cancers, especially in the Asian scenario. Why would you not want to just do a RUMI, which, which gives you almost similar results? Anastomotic leak, if it leads to, will lead to biliary peritonitis and an emergency, which might not happen with a RUMI gastric bypass. Sleepless procedures with proximal bypass, whatever data today we have, are not better than the Rouen-Y gastric bypass for diabetes. And we don't have long-term data. So maybe longer term, like we've seen in our data, a lot of people do regain weight with the sleep DJB. And you might actually see a, a not a very good result with diabetes. Sleep plus procedures with the distal bypass are definitely superior to the Rouen-Y gastric bypass, but carry quality of life questions, as well as nutritional sequelae. And maybe the new Rouen-Y gastric bypass with a longer limb, uh, um, biliopancreatic limb, almost comes close to some of the results with the uh, SARDS or the BPDDS, if you bypass more than 150 to 200 centimeters of the biliopancreatic limb. But I do agree that in countries of East Asian origin where cancer is very, very prevalent, like Korea, Japan, and some parts of China, that a sleeve bypass will still remain a better option. So I would like to say that let's not reinvent the wheel. In a majority of our patients of Asia, even other than East Asia, we do know that a Rouen-Y gastric bypass works irrespective of whether they're high BMI, low BMI. So let's not reinvent the wheel because let's not try and be the first guy to do a procedure because just like this cartoon says, he shouted about something new invention and that's what hit him. Thank you so much. Thank you, Murphy. That was a great presentation. I am almost uh, convinced by your presentation, but Dr. Seki will try to convince you by his presentation regarding uh, a three plus. So, Professor Seki, yes, please start yes. your presentation. Okay, I try to do my best. Um, you see my, you see my slide. Yes. Okay. Okay, so it's an uh, my role is a sleep plus. And first of all, uh, I don't want to, I don't include the it's in a purely restricted procedure like a duodenal switch on the SADI and as a sleep plus procedure because it's an, uh, I believe it's an, uh, this kind of procedures is not ideal for the Asian patient. It's too aggressive. So this is, um, so. Oh, sorry. So it's a, this is a trend in the percentage of bariatric metabolic surgery worldwide. You know, it's as you know, the trend in bariatric procedure is very dynamic. It's and we are still looking for the ideal procedure. And then right now, the as Mufi said, the sleep is the number one procedure in the world, accepted procedure in the world. So it's now what is good and bad in the gastric bypass. And the good thing is, as you know, the the very strong um, procedure for the girl and the strong procedure for diabetes as well. And the bad thing might be the marginal ulcer and dumping syndrome, both of which deteriorates the patient's quality of life significantly and the gastric cancer things. So it's an incidence of gastric cancer is comparatively high in East Asian countries, such as in Korea, Japan, China. And if you look at the literature, it's, you can 
find the then handful of the gastric cancer in the remnant stomach after gastric bypass or even a mini gastric bypass. So we cannot ignore. Actually, uh, we do have a couple of an um, experience of the then a retrograde double balloon uh, endoscopy as uh, to look it look into the bypass stomach for the screening purpose. But then, uh, quite honestly, it's just a pain. It's not ideal. It's not good for the screening purpose. So the, recently, it's now we experienced a very impressive case. This is a 60-year-old lady uh, seek, coming to us seeking for diabetes treatment, and the, we did a sleep DJB uh, for this patient, for this specific patient. And the after one year after sleep DJB. Uh, at the time of the routine endoscopy, we detected an early gastric cancer lesion at the distal tube. And the pathology was successfully treated by endoscopic submucosa dissection technique. So it's an, uh, if, if we offer the run y gastric bypass for this specific patient, it would be very difficult uh, to detect this pathology at an early stages. So this is the sleep DJB. And our favorite procedure, sleep plus procedure. Uh, it's a no remnant stomach and the DJP effect and ghrelin effect and less dumping and less also because we preserve the physiological valve pyloric ring. So this is a um, comparison uh, in terms of the prevalence of the dumping syndrome between the sleep gastrectomy and the renal gastric bypass. As you know, it's on um, the prevalence of the dumping syndrome is statistically significantly uh, higher in the gastric bypass group. And this is a very, very interesting study uh, using the uh, wireless Blabo system. It's in a pH monitor. The study group put on two uh, Blabo system, uh, proximal and distal to the pyrus after the duodenal switch surgery one of the pylorus preserving surgery. And the, they show the percentage of time with pH under four was 70 um, pre-pylorus and 13 post-pylorically. So their conclusion that duodenal bulb had a large buffering effect, counteracting the large amount of gastric acid passing into the small bowel, this physiologic effect could explain the low incidence of stomach ulcers. And the glucose variability is um, <clears throat> the study group uh, using the continuous glucose monitoring. And they show the stomach per uh, pylorus preserving surgery, DS, demonstrated a less pronounced postplandial glucose variability compared to the gastric bypass. The implication of the glucose variability in bariatric surgery is unclear. But then from the viewpoint of the um, endocrinology, the postplandial variability leads to, potentially leads to the diabetes complication. So it's not good. So what's good and what's bad in sleep gastrectomy? The bad point in the sleep gastrectomy is in the GERD and the probably the less effective for advanced diabetes and long-term weight loss durability. So this is a randomized control trial um, published by Praveen, comparing the Renoir gastric bypass and sleep DJB, it's an already uh, mentioned by Mufi, and they show the exactly the same effect between uh, in terms of the weight loss and diabetes remission between the two procedures. And this is our own case series for advanced diabetes patients. The it's an anti-diabetic effect is very good almost comparable or even better uh, than in the gastric bypass. And its effect is pretty durable, at least in up to five years. So this is another sleep plus procedure. It's in a sleep with transit by partition. It's and you can see that two lumen, uh, one is the pylorus and the other is an uh, gastroileal anastomosis. And the, you can see the pretty durable weight loss effect at up to five years and diabetes and is improved without the duodenal exclusion. And this is another uh, sleep plus procedure. 
sleep gastrectomy with jejunal bypass. <clears throat> it's a comparative study between the runway bypass and the, this procedure. Up to around three years. Diabetes remission similar, weight loss similar, and complications similar. But in, uh, but in uh, hemoglobin and calcium was lower in the gastric bypass group. So this is the another uh, sleep plus procedure, the loop DJB proposed by the CK1, one of the panelists today. Uh, he compared the run Y gastric bypass and loop DJB case matched. So it's an, uh, their result is an operation time is a little bit longer in the sleep DJP group, but the weight loss similar and the resolution of comorbidities is quite similar between the two groups. This is almost the same procedure uh, done by Professor Wei J. Li, uh, Taiwan. It's a loop DJP. Their conclusion is an operation time is a little bit longer in the loop DJP group. But the you know, weight loss is better in better than the gastric bypass, and the resolution of comorbidity is better than the gastric bypass without difference in nutritional status. And they recently published a five-year result of the sleep uh, loop uh, DJP, and they show the durable uh, loop DJP is a durable primarily bariatric procedure, procedure with sustained weight loss and a high resolution of diabetes at five years. But again, that did not occur this the major side effect. So it's uh, in the latter half of my presentation, I talk a little bit about this sleep gastrectomy plus an anti-reflux procedure. Of course, the gold standard is converting to the gastric bypass, but the other alternatives is, is, uh, is an uh, a radio frequency ablation, it's a strata procedure, and the links prosthesis and sleep plus fan application, and ligament and terrorist cardiopexy, and electrical stimulation. So it's in a new concept is coming year by year and validated. And the, some of the um, uh, some of them is a very promising. It's in a links, as you know, it's a magnetic sphinx the augmentation system, FDA approved. And the long-term efficacy and safety is already shown uh, for the primarily GERD surgery. And the and the their result of the placing the links after sleep gastrectomy is very good. All patients greatly improved GERD after two to four weeks, and all had a lower DMS. The master score with a significant decrease in the frequency and severity of their symptoms. And the, this is the sleep plus ligamentum teres cardiopexy proposed by CK Huan. And the, he recently published their initial early experience. And the, based on um, their data, and the result is pretty good. Uh, the follow up late up to six months. The symptomatic GERD requiring PPI was decreased significantly. So it's an, ladies and gentlemen, in summary, currently the sleep is the most widely accepted bariatric metabolic procedure worldwide, especially in the AP region. And the gastric cancer is more prevalent in the AP. Major drawbacks of the sleep and de novo GERD and durability of the diabetes control. However, the various new procedures complement to sleep, that is sleep plus, have been invented and validated. Some are very promising, despite the paucity of long-term data. So in conclusion, in my opinion, sleep plus is superior to gastric bypass and probably the more important, especially in the AP, although there are different needs for additional evaluation under PrEP from proper framework to ensure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yosuke. Thank you. I'm also by almost convinced by your presentation, and uh, I'd like to ask Mufaza to counter him. So, Seki, a great presentation. I had only a few points to raise from your presentation. You admitted that GERD remains a problem. Now, with the sleep plus, it you do understand that there is a, a mixed reflux, right? So, you are going to get bile up in the esophagus. 
in, in countries which have high prevalence of gastric and esophageal cancer, do you think it is worthwhile considering this? Because the time to duration to pick up a cancer might be anywhere close to uh, 15 years and beyond. So are we doing a bit too much right now to begin with? The next thing I wanted to ask you is that rather than doing complex procedures like the Sphinx and putting ligamentum teres around it, why not just do a Ruamai gastric bypass, which you self-admittedly said is a better anti-reflux procedure. Now, if there is a concern with gastric cancer, what I would say is why not add a remnant gastrectomy, which is a much simpler procedure to do rather than doing, if you're removing two thirds of the stomach, why not remove maybe a little bit more and do a remnant gastrectomy if, if uh, cancer of the stomach is that much of a concern. Because then you've, you've removed the entire stomach, so there's not going to be anything. We do also know from all the data that you've shown is that long-term durability of uh, diabetes remission is always going to be a question despite the great results that you and your team uh, with Kazoo showed at five years. So my question is, let's not complicate matters. Let's keep things very simple because it's... Uh, Simple things are easier done by majority of us who are not as gifted as you and Seki and uh, CK who are sitting on this panel. So for uh, uh, me and Ken and the rest of us, I think a Ruamai gastric bypass is a much better procedure. Thank you so much. All right. So it's an, uh, I think the time is limited. So it's an, uh, I answer very simply, quickly. It's an, uh, okay. So number one, the, it's an, uh, um, and so the rejection of the remnant uh, stomach, it's an, uh, we, we actually did a um, handful of the rejectional uh, gastric bypass in our experience, but it's not easy. And, and not easy means, uh, you know, it's an, uh, we need to extend the wound, it's an uh, wound complications and uh, bleeding complications. And the, <clears throat> so I think it's an, uh, um, uh rejection of gastric bypass is uh, not a good uh choice this is one thing and it's a uh, mixed uh, reflux it's an uh, the, one of the point uh, i want to emphasize is the preserving the pylorus yeah so it's uh it's not the same the mini gastric bypass uh, of course the after the mini gastric bypass and the bi reflux could be a very serious problem in the 10 years and 15 years from now the gastric cancer uh, caused by the bioreflux could be a problem, but it's in a it's in a pylorus preserving uh, procedure like in a sleep DJB and even a loop DJB. Uh, in my experience, the there is a very small uh, incidence, small chance uh, that I found the bioreflux inside the uh, gastric tube. This is my opinion. And it's an uh, what is the other one? The simple, <laughs> simple procedure. <laughs> Um, it's an, uh, in, uh, in, in our, in, a, in our medical community, it's an, uh, still, um, it's an, uh, um, possibility of the gastric cancer in the remnant stomach is, um, a higher, uh, priority. So, um, I answer, I, I answer your questions. <laughs> I think we, yeah, we kind of, uh... Okay. Mufi talked about uh, esophageal cancer after three and three plus procedures. How do you yeah. think about this? Yeah, it could be a very serious problem than, uh, uh, in the next five years and 10 years. And because you know, we found more and more uh, denial carcinoma at each junction of the sleep gastrectomy case reports. So it's an, uh, it could be a very serious problem. So it's, um, <clears throat> we need to uh, validate, and it's, and uh, we have, now we have um, a couple of um, options like an uh, CKs and ligamentum teres cardiopexy and links and the, so it's now uh, we need, we are waiting a more rigid uh, data, but could be a very serious problem. Okay, thank you, Yosuke. So the, the next, we'd like to have our question from audience. So the audience here, please the, write your question to the, the question, uh, I mean, positions. 
Uh, during that time, so we'd like to ask my um, panelists regarding the question that uh, Mufazal raised. Actually, the, the esophageal cancer, the Barrett esophageal cancer, could be a problem after sleep gastrectomy and sleep plus procedures. And I know that Dr. Professor Che is one of the, the, the experts of the esophageal and the gastric cancer in our region. So how do you think about uh, Barrett esophageal cancer in Asia? Do you think uh, it's, it's not so co common compared to Western countries? So what's your opinion? I think it depends on area. Uh, Korea and Japan, uh, esophageal cancer is uh, relatively rare. And uh, even though patients who have a reflux, uh, they don't have a high, they don't have a high instance of uh, uh, esophageal cancer. But in China, I think the situation is a little bit different. Uh, the mm -hmm. esophageal cancer incidence is relatively high. So maybe uh, in Korea and Japan, uh, Sleepy Plus is maybe a good option. But in China, it's my personal uh, opinion. In China, maybe uh, they should be checked every year uh, after uh, Sleepy Plus, or they should avoid another, uh, they should find another procedure. That's my opinion. Oh, that's great. So I didn't know so much the esophageal cancer in China. So <laughs> is that cancer? Esophageal cancer in China is um, also uh, uh, adenocarcinoma, like uh, like you know the the Barrett esophageal cancer. How do you think, uh, Dr. Huang? Yeah, she can know much about China. <laughs> Shiki, can you hear me? We cannot hear you, CK. Maybe CK. it's a mute. We can hear. You have to CK. unmute the phone, CK. Yeah. There's a microphone button. Ken, what can uh, you say to no, that? Then? No, we can Ken, hear. Ken, what's your opinion? Can oh, you can hear, hear you now. Okay, yeah. good. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Oh, yes. uh, oh, okay. About esophageal cancer in Taiwan is also quite a rare, but it's a little increasing. I think it's related to some uh, alcohol drinking now. And uh, in south part of China, there's uh, some province, they are very highly uh, prevalent in uh, esophageal cancer. In fact, I agree that sleep gastrectomy can cause reflux problems, yes. And so uh, I think it's a more uh, high prevalent surgery now in the world. I think that as a surgeon, we need to find out the reasons and try to solve the problems. In our data showing most severe reflux after sleep gastrectomy, most is 75% uh, comes from the intrathoracic migration of the sleep tube. So uh, now we need to fix the tube. Uh, after finishing the sleep gastrectomy. So I think that will be decrease a lot of instance of a de novo reflux. The second is, uh, I think esophageal cancer are not related to reflux only. I think gene and uh, food and also the bioreflux are all the potential uh, risk uh, for the developing the esophageal cancer. So you see that in Western countries, they are much more high prevalent compared with Asian groups. So I think right now uh, we cannot conclude that uh, esophageal cancer could be really increased a lot in uh, Asian group uh, if the patient develops severe reflux. In my uh, quite thousands of cases of sleep gastrectomy, we did not have any case develop by rates esophagitis after sleep gastrectomy, even five years more data showing that. So I think uh, sleep plus, uh, Yes, it might have the issue of the reflux, but uh, if you treat it concomitantly during uh, the first operation, maybe fix the tube, use the ligamentum tears, or uh, do some uh, preventive manner, then maybe some someone would uh, invent new uh, methods. 
I think that that will solve the problem. Okay. I just want to make a comment. I do actually, you know, I mean, in my cohort, I actually have two patients after gastric bypass actually develop esophageal cancer. So you would think that gastric bypass actually will be having a lower risk of developing esophageal cancer. I, I think it's kind of, it is related, but it's not dependent. Uh, the comment about cancers, I guess, coming from the Australian's perspective, the fact we are sitting here discussing this is because we still haven't got the perfect procedure. You know, you all know the history of lab band in Australia that is originated in here and it comes and it goes. So at the moment, we're seeing the procedure that is so far the most durable is still gastric bypass. Um, sleeve is durable enough, but we start to see some failure and therefore we're having them talk about this plus, you know, thing. So the problem about the plus is, are we plusing for treating complications or preventing complications? Or are we plusing because we want to treat, we want to add additional metabolic effects? So, so you've got to differentiate between both. And all this variation of bypass, I think, you know, we've got to be careful because I think we're here talking to a lot of the younger guys that are starting the procedure. Um, they might be competent surgeon, but I think if it's not done right, there's catastrophic consequences. Okay, thank and you. Another, 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 uh, another question to uh, Dr. Seki. Yes. Uh, some patient who received the Ruang eye gastric bypass suffered from severe postprandial hypoglycemia. Mm -hmm. In Korea, we also have a, a experience of a severe postprandial hypoglycemia after Ruang eye gastric bypass. Uh, especially for patients who uh, like to eat uh, some uh, carbohydrate and uh, sweet fruit, then uh, they uh, suffered from severe postprandial hypoglycemia, maybe shock, and they go to an emergency room. So I think it's a, uh, one of a major problem in Asia. And uh, sleep itself also has, shows the hypoglycemia too. So I want to ask you a question. The sleep plus may be a higher instance of a hypoglycemia compared to sleep itself. So what is your opinion about that? Um, yes, uh, thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, tonight, um, based on my experience of the sleep DJB, run Y DJB, the symptomatic damping syndrome, the instance is quite, quite low compared to the gastric bypass. And it's an, uh, in my impression, there is no big difference between the sleep alone and the sleep DJB. So it's an, I think the, again, the preserving the pylorus is very useful to reduce the incidence of the uh, postglandial um, uh, glucose not variability. Um, so it, so it's, a, it's another, it's an advantage of the a sleep plus procedure, preserving the pylorus. Aha, uh -huh. thank you. But still, not, but, uh -huh. but again, but yet not zero, not zero. <laughs> yeah. Can but I much come better, on in much, this? Yeah. Yep. Can I come, give a little comment? Because uh, I think the postprandial uh, hypoglycemia, we find uh, three cases in our previous rule and white gastric bypass uh, series. Uh, these three cases, they present with uh, severe uh, dumping syndromes and uh, the sugar dropped to less than 60 after you do the OGTT test. So we decide to convert the case to back to the sleep or sleep plus procedure or the dumping syndrome and postprandial uh, hypoglycemia disappear. We publish in the papers. But in sleep procedure or sleep plus procedure, we till now, even the case series is much more than the RUI, but uh, we did not see any cases have these kind of problems. So I think that the pyrus preserving is still very uh, important to uh, prevent the dumping, especially for severe dumping. I agree with, I agree with your Seki that uh, dumping still can happen in sleep, but most of the symptoms very mild and it can be corrected by your foot change. But in severe dumping syndromes in uh, Ruwai, especially in late dumping, 
cause hypoglycemia one. In some cases, you will see it's very severe. The patient even get fainting on the road. So I think it's an issue for the, those who consuming more carbohydrate country like Asia. Can I ask a question to uh, Dr. Laktawala? Uh, in Asian who are not tall and obese, diabetes, then sometimes they have very short mesentery and a very thick mesocolon. So mm -hmm. it is not nearly impossible to make uh, anticholic gastrogenostomy. So we should make a uh, retrocolic gastrogenostomy in the case. But in the case also, make a hole through the mesocolon is very difficult and dangerous. So I think in the case, Sleep plus is uh, technically easier. So what is your opinion about that? So Professor Choi, that's a good question. We've not really technically found it a problem once you've divided the split, the momentum in the midline. We've, we've done higher BMIs like 70, 70 plus, and we've not really faced a problem. However, what you're saying is if uh, doing a gastric bypass is going to be a challenge, then it will be also a challenge to do dissect the duodenum in such a, a heavy patient. So I would rather say then just do a sleep rather than doing a sleep plus at the same time, because uh, both are two different aspects. If if your technical challenge is there, then I think safety is the most important concern. However, uh, going back to the last discussion that CK and Seki had, I want to ask both of you if we do scopies. Uh, in normal patients, irrespective of before bariatric surgery, because we do all our patients uh, pre-op uh, scopy, how many of these patients have bile already in the stomach? And what is the relevance of the pylorus then? Because if there's bile before a surgery, how many of those cases do you think that post uh, sleep plus procedure, they will not have bile in the stomach? CK. Uh <laughs> Okay, uh, this is a good question. Uh, in fact, we routinely do pendoscope by our gastroenterologist. So if during the pendoscope we find that it's bile in the stomach, I think it's a relative contraindication to rule and white gastric bypass, but not the contraindication to, to uh, sleep plus. Because when you have bio re regurgitation to your stomach, when you exclude the stomach, you don't know what happened after 10 years. 20 years later, the intestinal metaplasia can happen and you cannot screen it. So when the patient has bioreflux pre-op, I think that you would better do sleep procedures, but not the Y. But I don't have the percentage, but in our series, in my own uh, observation, it's quite low in Taiwan cases. I think maybe less than 1% that pre-op there is bioreflux in the stomach. And um... <clears throat> Yes, and uh, I also then do not have an exact data. It's and uh, how many how percentage of the patient found uh, by live by reflux, but it's and uh, this is a debate uh, between the between the renal gastric bypass and sleep plus. But it's and uh, uh, among the various types of the sleep plus procedure, it's and uh, we the reason we prefer the renal sleep DJB is the um, because of the by reflux you know, because it's uh, after renal bypass we don't. We don't find the bi reflux in, into the sleep. So. I have a question for Mufi. Okay, uh, because this is a debate of uh, comparing Ruai and uh, sleep plus. But uh, I think that in your hand, you still do sleep plus procedure, right? So, what's your indication for that? And what's your contraindication for Ruai get treated by bus? So my contraindication for Ruamai gastric bypass would definitely be like the list that I put up. Any patient with uh, inflammatory bowel disease, any patient with uh, a, a cirrhotic uh, child's B plus and C and various other things, um, a patient with uh, bad uh, kidney disease where the creatinine is above 4, 4.5, so grade 2, grade 3. Uh, so those would be clear-cut indicators. Uh, contraindications for a gastric bypass. Someone who's a smoker and who's not given to give up smoking, I think the risk of marginal ulcer would be much, much higher. So for me, the classical indication for a sleep uh, DJB would be someone who wants uh, 
who's a smoker, but still irrespective of that wants, uh, and we know that sleeve alone will not work for them. So maybe a sleeve DJB would be a good enough option. Uh, like I showed you, we did 30 cases. We didn't really get very good results, at least in the complex diabetics. We thought by passing 200 centimeters of your biliopancreatic limb would give us the results. We, we were a little disappointed. We did not get the same results as we hoped we would get. Uh, but uh, that's what our take is. So sleep DJB is very, very few patients now we do them on because Ruama gastric bypass is our standard uh, time tested proven that, uh, procedure. We've started increasing the biliopancreatic limb. Maybe two years later, I might be able to give you better data. Now our standard rule limb, uh, biliopancreatic limb size is around 150 and 200 centimeters for a Ruama gastric bypass. Yeah, this is very important issue about uh, length of BP limb and uh, other limbs after bypass or DGB procedures. But I need to tell that, that, that there are some questions from audience. One is talking about uh, gastric cancer in a laminate stomach. So what do you think about the gastric cancer in a laminate stomach from a viewpoint of the gastric cancer surgeon, Professor Che? Uh, still, uh, in Korea, we also have many debate uh, because yep. the, uh, the patient who do not have a high risk factor, no high uh, H. pyro infection and no pre-cancerous lesion, no family history, then uh, the remnant stomach is prevented from the carcinogen. So maybe uh, the gastric cancer is not high, uh, very rare in the case. Uh, this is the one uh, hypothesis who favored the uh, uh, gastric bypass. But still, uh, the instance of uh, gastric cancer in Korea, Japan, also in China is uh, uh, high. So uh, uh, we should be cautious to about that. So personally, uh, if I have a, a, a patient who want a Ruang I gastric bypass, I checked many things no H. pyro infection, no precancerous region, and no family history. And also, I uh, explained a lot to remnant gas cancer. So, but still in Korea, uh, it is just cautious. Can I ask a question? Because um, in that case, in the country, if you have patients that is high risk, why can't you also spend a little bit more time and resect the stomach at the same time of the bypass? It okay. might sound radical, but it probably the way that you can kind of minimize the potential future risk. Okay. Uh, sometimes, personally, I perform the resectional gastric bypass too, but uh, I have a patient who have a severe hypoglycemia after uh, Ruang Ai gastric bypass. Then uh, I stop the resectional gastric bypass uh, because. Uh, uh, any patient who have a very severe, severe uh, hypoglycemia, then uh, maybe I need uh, some uh, revisional surgery too. Uh, that's my uh, opinion. Good. Thank you, Professor Che. And also we have some questions regarding how often do we need to screening for endoscopy after surgery? So Lu and Y and uh, the three plus. What do you think? Every year. Okay. Every, Every year, year for me. Yes. How about you, Ken? Ken? Symptomatic. Only if they are symptomatic. I think in Australia the incidence are not as high as Asian. So I guess unless the patient ethnicity is uh, Asians or family history, we usually um, only screen if patients are symptomatic. Mm -hmm. How about you, Yosuke? And um, we don't do we don't do right now, but it's an uh, I recommend that's a yearly endoscope, uh, especially for the sleep patient. How about you, Rufi? I think it is mandatory that, irrespective of the symptoms or not, you should be doing a yearly endoscopy after all bariatric procedures, because. Uh, uh, some of the unpublished data, and we should be publishing it very soon, it is part of the 
we've seen the number of marginal ulcers with the rheumatoid gastric bypass have increased dramatically just because it's asymptomatic patients we are scoping. The amount of reflux uh, esophagitis has also gone up very, very high in those patients who are asymptomatic post sleep gastrectomy. So I think it is mandatory mm -hmm. that we do endoscopies in all our pediatric patients if cost is not really the concern or you figure out a way of featuring it into their cost. Hey, thank you. So how about you, Professor Che? Uh, yeah, just uh, I don't have a, a data, but uh, after 40 years old, I recommend every year check, but uh, before that, uh, two or three were mandatory so if they have a symptom. Okay, thank you. So that uh, I need the many things to discuss more, but uh, time is very limited. So why don't you go to the last poll? So do you think a three plus is better than three alone for Asian diabetic patient? So some kind of Asian patient, diabetes patient, need uh, not only sleep, but also need a sleep plus procedure. Or sleep alone is enough for Asian patient. Good. Please show us the result. Yes, so the, the many of you think the three plus procedure is better than three balloon for Asian diabetes patient. So the last question to audience is, so do you think the gastric bypass is better than three plus for Asian patient? This is the same question at the first, the poll, I mean, the before discussion. So please vote. Okay, let me show the result. Wow, it's changed. The first time that yes was 60, uh, 58%. Now, no, which means the three percent is better, is uh, 56%. So that um, both Mufi and uh, Yosuke did a great job. And the Yosuke can convince uh, a few uh, participants. And um, that's a great deal. Thank you. So it's a time limited, so that I'd like to conclude uh, this webinar. So can we see the, the panel's face? Manuela. Manuela, can you show us the face of panelists? No. Okay. Anyway, that um, we need to see um, the the discussion. You know, not closed yet, so that uh, we will have the more discussion at the IFSO Madrid at the IFSAPC session. So, if you are very interesting to join this kind of discussion, please come to IFSO Madrid and uh, the join our the session of the SAPC. Is there any comment from the panelist? Is it okay? I just want to I, I, I just want to make a brief comment. I'm in Greece, so I just visited the place uh, of a regional medicine called Hippocrates and remember the oath <laughs> is do no harm. So I think besides understanding the potential and the power of treating all the disease, we got to make sure that we don't cause any complications. So we need to actually encourage the surgeon if they want to do the procedure, report the side effect, report the complication, so the people can decide 
based on their experience and their technical experience and the country and the culture and what they eat to decide which procedure is best for them. Hmm, that's a good comment. Anyone? Adi? Okay, so thank you everyone. Well, thank you speakers and panelists and the audience here. So it was a very nice webinar from IFSAPC. So uh, okay. I'd like to see all of you in Madrid in September. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good night.